I am now recording it. I'm sorry, I said I was going to record it and then I didn't. I got too excited. I will, I will send you the presentation, Jane, if you want. It was on. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Any questions? Ooh, that's not good. That probably shows that. Was that sort of the right level? I'm, I'm never really sure. It's, I find talking about meteorology quite difficult. Yes. Uh, your Maria. Yes, you're, I've unmuted. Yeah. Um, Tom, I just wanted to check him, but I think I understood it. On the turbulence, when you were saying about um, uh, the, um, the gradients, um, and I was just thinking, with the turbulence, what you mean is that it's more shifty, not that it's necessarily more windy. Is that correct? Um, so, okay. So, um, what I was talking about, well, one of the things I was talking about was the difference between night and day. So what happens during the night, you, you've got over the, above the boundary layer, you have the sort of geostrophic flow, the general flow of the, of the wind. And then you've got the bit, the boundary layer, which connects the, the, the sort of free atmosphere to the, to the surface. And the free atmosphere is just blowing at the same time. You know, the wind is the same the, the whole time. Uh, as it becomes less stable, uh, it, when it's stable, it's sort of decoupled. So the surface wind is is lighter, and then as it as you becomes more turbulent uh, during the day, as the, as you get uh, convective bubbles forming, um, and the the surface warms, that wind can come down towards the surface. So during the day, it tends to be windier than it does at, at night. Okay, so it's windier, but not necessarily shiftier then. I, I mean, well, and shiftier because it, it's it's more turbulent. I mean, the 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 fact it's more turbulent will become more shifty. And and, and also th this is important if you look at the the frontal systems. That's the other thing. So you get a, a wind direction change as the frontal system goes through. But if, for example, a cold front goes through, so in the warm sector you've got nice warm air underlying perhaps a fairly warm surface, and it you know it's not unstable. As the cold front goes across, the ground is still warm from the, uh, it's still warm, but you've got cold air going across it. And that means you've got, uh, uh, that means that the, 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 the air becomes unstable. And so as the cold front goes through, it can become more shifty. And you get, you tend to get um, little sort of convective clouds. You, you get showers actually as, as the, you know, that's the, the, the thing you forecast in the cold as the cold front goes through you you forecast for there to be showers uh, and the showers mean that you've got uh, you know from our point of view we don't care about the showers of course what we care about is that as the the little um, cumulus clouds go over you're going to get uh, changes in the wind direction and and if you understand that you can go and use uh, use that to, to your advantage does Thank that you. Does yeah, that... That, yeah, I just got confused by the word turbulence and I was trying to think whether it meant just shifting around or whether it also meant it was windier, that was what I was. Uh, well, a, a bit of both often is, is the... Thank Any... you. Anything else? Can I ask a question? You can. <laughs> uh, on your first graph, you've got going up was the distance versus the type of like... It, it, that was the time on the, the other axis. On the x-axis, it was time. Time. So does that mean time that it goes across? I'm being. I didn't. Understand. Well, it's it's sort of yeah. It, it is. I mean, it's the sort of time the phenomenon lasts. Oh, how it lasts. Okay. Well, well. So if if you've got you know if you're looking at um, it's a sort of the time scale. I mean that that diagram, the only one I could find, was actually looking at the time scale. When you were thinking about how you modelled those those things, but right. so you know, a, a frontal system, for example, you know a, a weather system, you would expect it to affect the weather over several days. A single system will affect it over several days, whereas you know a small cloud will affect the weather over you know 10, 20 minutes. Right. 
So, you know, I, I'm trying to show that, you know, there are a whole series of things and, you know, what you're interested in hunts, you know, when, you, when you're down there and you're just about to launch, you're not really interested in what's going to happen, you know, you know, even in the afternoon or the next yeah. day, you're interested in what's going to happen for the next hour. And that's really the, the sort of the turbulence uh, and the, the flow of, uh, around the lake and the, the, the changes that will be caused by sort of clouds going past and possibly, just possibly, if a frontal system is going through, you might get a change, but it's that sort of time scale. You don't want to worry about the, the larger scale. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's put, trying to put, yeah, putting it into context of hunts is if I went out and there was a quick change in the front, would I <laughs> need to get back in quickly? Uh, well, I, I'm not, <coughs> I hear I'm trying to tell you what, what you need to know to take advantage of it. And, and really, you know, to take advantage of it when you're racing, what you really want to do is to, to think about what's going to change in the next five, yeah. ten minutes, so you can know, you know when to tack when you're going upwind and, uh, you know, and, and can you go and predict that in any way so that you can be in the right place to do the tack? And it's really quite difficult, and I'm really bad at it. Very technical. <laughs> John, though, on the other hand, on the whole, tends to be quite good at it. Oh, thank you. Oh, so, so the other thing is, where Vanessa was saying, don't follow people. Certainly, don't follow me when you're you're racing, but perhaps follow John. John. Okay. Yes, Maria. I just have a question. Um, when you said about Gus coming before um, Columbus climbs, that's how you pronounce it, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you said you can spot those. Is that when you see that kind of dark, how do you spot them on the water? Is that the dark shadow you see or like a ripple? Yeah, so, so, yes, I mean, I, I think I was saying, you know, it, particularly if it's going to be a big cumulonimbus where you're going to get a really big gust front, a squall, you can see it because the cloud goes, you know, you, you see this big massive black cloud uh, approaching, possibly with thunder and lightning. And of course, if there's thunder and lightning, you know, Wait. <laughs> it's you, you probably want to get get ashore um but but then in front of that you're likely to get a really quite strong squall um but how will we know it, what them oh well you you see this big black cloud and you see that it's a you know it's very deep so you know if it's deep it tends to mean that there's a lot of ascent in it there's a lot of motion in it and so you're likely to get a a, a gust front associated with it but you know, the other thing you can do is you can see if, you know, if it's uh, a nice sunny day with sunny intervals, uh, if you see these little smaller cumulo cl cumulus clouds, you will get changes in the wind associated with that. So you can see, you know, you can see them coming across and then you'd be able to see the gust on the water and they'll be much smaller scale. I mean, the, the, the gust fronts associated with, with a, a big QNIM will be, you know, kilometres across. And so they will just, you know, sweep right across the, the lake. Whereas the, the gusts associated with, a, with smaller clouds, you know, you'd be able to see that they're, you know, affecting half the lake, but not, not the half you're on. And so you can, you can plan your course. Uh, uh, and when you say they're affecting half the lake, how would we know? Is it, do you see something on the water or is uh, it? Yeah. So, yeah. The, so the best way of telling where the wind is, is looking on the water. And, and that's what you have to do. And I, perhaps I didn't emphasize that enough. You know, looking to how you can tell how the wind is, is being affected by the trees on the bank, by you know, the shape of the lake, by, by the, the, the smaller clouds, is looking on the water and seeing where the, the, the blackness of, of the water is. People have said you have shadows in the water before. I was just checking that was what you're supposed to do. You, I mean, it's this keeping your head out of the boat, and and particularly if you're in a two-man boat, like Dirk, you know, you you've got you know double the number of eyes to look on the water, and so you should, if you're in a two-man boat, really making sure that one person is all the time looking out and and seeing where you know, where the wind is, where the other people are. And then you've got someone to go and sail the boat and someone to look where the, the wind is, which is why, you know, people think crewing a two man boat is, is, you know, it's easy. It isn't, you know, you, you, you should almost be equal, equal partners in it. Tom. Oh, yes. So in simple terms, you're looking at 
a, a big cloud. You're seeing a big cloud in the sky about to come over you. You're looking at the water in front of the cloud and you're seeing the dark ripples because the turbulence is in front of the cloud. And you're also using something like the trees on the shore to see the direction in which the wind is blowing in the turbulence. Uh, well, sort of. Um, sort of. So, so th I, think, I think the point I'm trying to make is that there are lots of things which affect where the wind is coming from. So it's affecting the, the, the trees around the lake will, you know, the, you've got the sort of the general flow of the air, which is caught, which is driven by these large weather systems. Uh, and that changes over the, you know, that, that will change in, over the periods of days. You, you've then got the impact of, of the clouds, which will impact the, the sort of, will, will, will superimpose a change in the winds uh, of, of the order of, of sort of minutes to, to hours. And then you have the, the, the sort of smaller scale turbulence, which is caused by the, the trees and the friction of the ground, which is sort of minutes to, 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 to tens of minutes. Right. Uh, and so they're all superimposed on top of each other. And, and the way you should go and see where the wind is coming from is by looking at the wind on the water. But it's, it's you know, by looking on the wind on the water, that's after it's happened. If you can in some way gain an insight and predict where the wind is going to change, that's when you get a real advantage. And, and although I can sort of talk about this theoretically, personally, I'm rather bad at doing this in practice. Right. Okay. Thanks. Is, is that any help? I, I mean, it's uh, again. It's one of these things with sailing. You know, d doing this on Zoom is completely pointless. You know, we should be out there practicing on the water, and that's the only way you really get it. But yeah. Any more questions before we move over to Ed? Right. I think we'll we'll go ahead with Ed and his downwind sailing. Super. So um, I'm going to talk about something that's even more practical than Tom's. Uh, so I very much well, wish we were the water. I think mine wasn't very practical at all, really. But <laughs> uh, let me share my screen. Two seconds. Right. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so yes, as Tom said, I'm going to be talking about how to sail uh, downwind and how to improve your speed and kind of some of the stuff to think about when sailing downwind. Uh, so uh, um, to start with, I'm going to be t looking at some of the different courses we use downwind. Uh, then we're going to talk about some boat speed, rules, tactics. Uh, any questions, feel free to just interrupt as I go or, or ask at the end. Um, so. Uh, I, I put this in just because if you if you go to uh, a regatta somewhere else or, or you're out and about, the, the, um, the courses are normally quite similar. So this is a, a trapezoid course, which is kind of a, a, a standard world sailing course, which is used at uh, quite a lot of the, the larger events. But I just thought I'd put it in because the first time I saw this, I was absolutely petrified uh, because it looks quite intimidating. Uh, so I just thought I'd talk it through um, briefly. Uh, while I thought about it. So you normally start and finish either at the same place or around the same boat. Uh, there's a couple of variations, of course, but if I just talk about the one on the left. Uh, so this one, we go up to buoy one and then down, of course, to buoy numbers four for some reason. Uh, and this is what the, what, at the bottom, what's called a gate. Uh, so we don't have these at hunts, uh, but other clubs are quite a lot more common, especially on the larger area and in particular the sea. Uh, and here you can go around either. Uh, so you can look uh, and see what you think is more favourable. Uh, and then you can choose to go around either 4A or 4P uh, down the bottom. Let me put my down the bottom here. Uh, and then from there, you go up and then you just sail around the course like usual. But I just thought I'd put that in because, uh, well, the first time I saw it, I couldn't understand it. Um, so in terms of improving boat speed, uh, I'm going to break it down into some of our five essentials, which are, uh, as I'm sure you know, the, the, the most essential parts of sailing, uh, which we can use to make us go fast. So uh, I think I've got a different slide on each. So we've got the bank board, the sail setting, balance, trim, 
uh, and course made good. And we can use all of these uh, independently uh, and adjust them accordingly to when we're going downwind uh, to optimize our sailing. So I like this picture uh, just because it's a bit mad, but it's illustrating a slightly different point to what I want, what the picture says. Uh, <laughs> so um, when we're going downwind, of course, we, we've got the wind directly that behind us. Of course, I just go back to that. The downwind leg is always going to be set so the wind is directly behind us. So we're always going to be sailing directly downwind. Uh, so that means we're going to need our sail all the way out. But it's really easy to misjudge this, uh, especially on boats which don't have shrouds. Uh, so peakers, lasers, etc., etc., toppers. Um, the point I was making with this photo is uh, if you can imagine where the boom is, it's not exactly 90 degrees out. Um, if you go 90 degrees like this, and then you've got the sail curve, the end of the sail ends up further than 90 degrees. So if you say uh, you're, you're not sure if you can see my, my camera, let's assume it's still on, uh, you've got a 90 degrees like that, and then you've got the curve of the sail like that, you end up at about almost 110 degrees. So what you should do really is you want your boom uh, to be slightly closer in, uh, about 80 degrees. So then the curve of your sail is at that 90 degrees. So this bit is perpendicular to your, uh, to your boom here. Um, an easy way to do this is uh, uh, when you're going out, when you're going out to do a race, on your, um, let your outhaul all the way off uh, and with the furthest setting you want. Then move your boom all the way out uh, till you get someone else to watch, till the curve is at 90 degrees uh, to the boat. And then just tie a knot at the end of the main sheet. Cause you know, at that point, your boom uh, shouldn't be going further out. Because if it is going further out and your sail is past that 90 degrees, it's less powerful. And also it's gonna affect your steering because uh, if you think about it, if the curve is like this, what it does is it forces your boat to kind of pivot uh, uh, downwind, which is not really what you want. Um, I've got a little video. I don't know if it will work. Um, I'm just going to... Uh, right. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is just a short video. I know you've covered sail setting briefly, but I found it really useful um, uh, as it, it showed directly what the van did downwind. Uh, so this is in the laser, but this applies to all types of boats. Uh, so it's not very long. Uh, I'll just pop this on. My name is Ruud Bouwmeester, and we're going to talk about how to set up the fan correctly in a laser. To check the fan as a sailor, if you don't have a tension around, it's by looking at your leads. You want to look at the lead tension. So, the fan is really loose, too loose. You see the top of your sail uh, opening completely. So, uh, as you can see, I'm not sure how clearly you can hear it. So, at the moment, his kicker is all the way off. And this leech at the back here is really flappy. So what that's doing, any wind that's hitting the sail is just being kind of propelled off. Um, uh, and it, it's a really big curve, which is fine when it's really light because the bigger the curve in the light wind, is the, the more wind it's catching. Uh, however, um, uh, what that's doing is flicking any, any wind off. Uh, uh, so it's not, not effective as such. Well, it looks like yeah, the top that's of the sail has actually opened all the way. Also, you notice it in the boat, you can see better body movement. It makes the boat really unstable and really hard to, to seal the boat. Really difficult, really difficult. The thing is too tight, you see it all flick and leave. Yeah, there we go. So that is when the kicker is really tight now. So we can see the leech uh, really tight. Um, and oh, I think it is going to explain what that is. It's not opening at all. The leech is really stiff. And when I ease the main sheet a bit, or press uh, in the boat on the desk, I don't see the leech opening at all. So what that's doing, when the leech is really tight, the sail's flatter. 
so in a light wind or a medium wind, um, uh, that, that's not very good downwind because when you're downwind, you basically want to kite. Uh, so when our, our kick is really tight, we're going to have a flat sail. The wind's just going to hit it and, and come off pretty quickly. Or if we have a bag, it can catch it and pushing us faster. Don't think it explains anything else in that one. Uh, let me just switch back to the PowerPoint. Uh, there we go. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so the main two points on that were um, uh, it, it's really easy to, to let your sail out too much downwind and also to forget about your sail. Uh, downwind is often the leg, you know, you might grab a drink, have a little biscuit and sit back. But as Tom was saying, the wind is changing so often, especially at hunts. It's really important to keep adjusting, uh, keep adjusting the sail and, and playing. It's, it's, it's the technical term, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, and just that, noting as such how far you let it out. Um, so uh, just a little more on the controls we can use to, uh, to, to control our sail. Uh, the video showed briefly about the kicker. I made a little, a little table. Uh, of course, this is only a guide, roughly. Um, but if we start with a light wind, the kicker, you want it really slack in light wind, uh, basically nothing on, or, or maybe just enough to take up the tension. Um, uh, this, this allows a really big curve, so uh, that will catch the wind then. Uh, and push us on like a kite. Uh, the outhaul, again, controlling how, how loose and tight and how much curve the sail has. Uh, we want that really loose to get uh, a nice big curve. Um, and then the downhaul. The downhaul really, downwind, is used to depower the sail. Uh, so as I put here in a big, big speech bowl, as soon as it gets a bit much and it's feeling a bit powerful, the first thing to do is put on loads of downhaul. One big pump of downhaul, cunning and whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that, that will really help to depower you. Uh, so as you see, medium wind, you're just it's tightening up. Uh, the main objective downwind is controlling how curved that sail is, how much like a kite, I suppose, that sail is. Um, brilliant. Uh, so moving on to our, uh, some of our other five essentials, balance and trim. Uh, balance being that way, trim being that way. Uh, so uh, it, it's easy downwind, uh, to sit way too far back. Um, but in smaller dinghies, especially uh, single-handed dinghies, you still need to sit quite a far forward, especially in light winds, you need to be sitting as far forward as you're going upwind. Um, it, in really light winds, the sail isn't necessarily going to fill, uh, and you can do a little heel towards the sail uh, to use gravity to, to your aid as such, uh, to, to um, fill the curve of the sail. Uh, so it keeps its shape if there's, there's really no wind. Uh, but other times it's easy to be rocking all over the place. Uh, but really, your the minimum amount of boats touching the water is going to be when your boat is perfectly flat. Uh, so in that case, flat flat is fast. Um, um, in terms of the trim, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, you don't want to be sitting too far back. Uh, this is it's particularly important on a lake. On the sea, it's slightly different because you've got waves. Uh, so you're going to be playing around with surfing them. Uh, and you want to be sitting further back on the sea to stop your nose diving going up and down waves. Uh, but on the lake, we, we don't get those. <laughs> so uh, uh, it, you don't really need to be sitting far back at all. Um, so, uh, well, I had some little resources on this. I put them in pictures to make it a bit easier. Uh, but I just thought I'd talk about some of the rules specific to uh, the downwind leg uh, and a little recap. I believe you've done racing rules in a previous session. Um, so uh, but before I, I maybe post this on the Hunts page later or something, the, this link here is a really good interactive game. Um, I don't know if I can show it to you. But basically, someone made it. It's available in loads of different languages. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's got different levels, medium, hard, uh, extra hard, I think, as well as an easy one. And it just presents you with five pod problems with animated boats uh, to test your rule knowledge and explains it after as well. So that's really useful. Uh, so I can post that somewhere. I do recommend it. Um, so I just thought I'd talk some of these situations just as a little recap. Uh, so here we have a port starboard situation. 
anyone want to chip in and say what boat is in the right? Anyone want to be brave? Red. Red, yes. Who said that and why? Oscar, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, why red? The reason why is because it's on port. I mean, Star Wars. Oh, Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Sitting on the right there on Star Wars. Um, so in terms of downwind, this, especially at Hunt, occurs all the time uh, as our courses are often crossing all over the place. Uh, so uh, again, anyone want to chip in? What boat do you think is in the right? What boat needs to move here? It's a windward lured situation as a, a little hint. Uh, blue is close to the wind, so red needs to move. Blue, so uh, blue is close to the wind, so red needs to move. Did you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I said. So, um, windward boats keeps clear uh, in this case. Uh, so yes. Uh, another one downwind often occurring. Um, any ideas who, in this case, would be up on front uh, and, and who needs to keep clear? Well, someone else apart from Oscar would get this one. <laughs> I'll go for it. Like sales or... Sorry, Roger? B Blue Boats is, is right of way. Yes. I'm, but I'm going for the old starboard idea. That, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Often forget, easy to forget about port and starboard downwind. But that's exactly the case. Uh, Blue is on starboard here. Uh, so red needs to keep clear. Um, okay, so this one I just thought I'd uh, talk through again to emphasize the port and starboard. Um, it's easy to, to think about your rules of keeping clear astern and things like that. But in this case, it's still just a port starboard situation. Uh, this doesn't occur often because, of course, uh, they're downwind and the sails on a different different side. Uh, but here, blue's on port, uh, red's on starboard. Uh, so so blue is going to need to keep clear uh, of red if, if, they, if red can catch up. Uh, so I did some beautiful drawing last night. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> some more drawings to come. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the previous one, though, because red's coming behind, if red is overtaking, then yeah. you should keep clear. So red, red can. However, if um, if red, I don't know if I can, maybe I can draw. Uh, so here we go. Hopefully you see this. Say, say red caught up. Of course, red can't just do that. That would be uh, completely against the rules and uh, in the wrong. However, if red caught up uh, and red was uh, positioned about here, can you see the drawing? Very yeah. hard. Um, about here with their sail here, uh, they're going to be on starboard uh, and blue is going to be on port. So blue is going to have to keep clear then, if that makes sense. That's it, but red is overtaking blue. Yes. So so surely if someone overtakes you, they should keep clear. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> if it's port star if they were on the same tack yes uh but as they're on port starboard port starboard takes precedent there so it's uh, last week we talked about the racing rules yeah and then the um i forgot the name of the other rules that applied before the race is the overtaking rule not a racing rule then no no so so yes it very much is uh however that that uh, would only apply if uh, they were on the the sail was on the same side. If that makes sense. So if they were if they were both on port or both on Star Wars. So then the person overtaking has got to give way. Yeah. But if they're on different tack, then the tack rule applies. I believe so. Yeah. So yes, that, that's right. I just to to confirm, you said the first time when red was approaching from from right from a stern sorry I think, I, because, I think because they are on different tacks blue still has to get out of the way yeah it, it is because port and starboard is the you know the yeah, your your first oh, precedent rule is such. exactly yes so jc are you, john are you are you on we are correct here Oh, he's gone. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I, I am on, but I'm, I'm in an RYA conference at the same time. Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> but the starboard boat does have right the right of way there. Definitely. Yeah, right. -o. Good. Just. Does that make sense? Ed, if, if the um, starboard boat has right of way, yeah. blue to get out of the way has to jibe. Yeah. And they're then both on starboard tack. Yeah, and then they're both on solid attack, and then your usual rules about when we're lured, overtaking boat, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, come into play. Right. Any other questions about that one? Is that is that clear with everyone? Well, Jeff has asked uh, how many medals will a team break back from Tokyo. Uh, that, Jeff. So just one more, uh, John. I don't think you've muted yourself. I can hear your conference. It's been great chatting with you all. And a massive thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, just a, a little drawing I did last night to emphasize, um, uh, I, I'm guessing it, you, have you talked about the, the going around the mark rules and the three boat length rules and stuff in your previous sessions? Yeah. No, no, I'm seeing nods. Yes, we have. You have, have, okay. Uh, so so uh, I just thought I'd talk about this one. So it's often the case, uh, you'll have two boats approaching, coming down next to each other downwind, and then they've got to go down around the wind with mark. Uh, so I just thought I'd emphasize here. So these boats are both approaching with an overlap. Uh, so at three boat lengths, they come with an overlap together. Uh, and that means the inside boat uh, has to has to have room to go around the mark. So in this case, blue cannot cut up here and has to give red to go around in a seaman like way. Uh, I just thought I'd mention that as a little reminder. Any questions on the rules or, or anything I've covered so far? Love it. Okay, perfect. Uh, so um, I just thought I'd talk about some little little tactics downwind. Uh, so the, the, your main tactic and uh, what makes a massive difference is something we call covering, uh, which is, is the act of, of blocking the wind to the boat in front of you as such. So I'm hoping I've got some, some yes, some beautiful draw diagrams here. Um, so the wind is coming down from the top. Uh, we've got boat A and boat B. Here, boat A sail, here we go. Boat A sail is going to cast a shadow down the lake uh, and boat B is going to be affected by that. So uh, if we can imagine putting something into the wind, basically the boat A sail is uh, blocking the wind to get from boat B. Uh, of course, it's not all the wind, but it makes a massive difference uh, in terms of the speed. Uh, so as particular, uh, if in this situation, they're coming down like this, uh, boat B has been completely covered as such, which means that the wind is being blocked by boat A's sail. This will mean boat B will be going significantly slower than boat A, uh, which means boat A can overtake. So one of the easiest ways to overtake downwind uh, is doing this, this covering, um, which, which means you're blocking the wind uh, uh, and then you really do overtake very quickly. Uh, but of course, when you have lots of boats on the race course, uh, it's very easy for everyone just to sit in a long line, everyone covering every out, everyone else. Uh, and often the case, you might need to either, uh, you can scoot up to one side of the course to kind of get what we call cleaner. Um, so here, uh, in this situation, um, boat A is producing dirty air. Dirty air means it's been uh, interacted by something, it's been influenced by something. Uh, in this case, it'll be full of little spirals, and, and um, uh, I'm sure there's a technical term I'm not aware of. Turbulence. Uh, turbulence. Turbulence. <laughs> uh, there'll be lots of turbulence uh, caused by the sail from A, uh, from a um, uh, which which won't be as good for B because the wind will be all over the place. In particular, in this situation, uh, but that's also present uh, going going up wind or in anything. If you have two boats going up wind next to each other, the wind from this boat will be clean which means it'll be coming straight down and just hitting the sail. While the, the uh, uh, underneath boat, uh, it will be coming off the boat to the top, causing loads of little turbulence uh, and influencing that. So that's one really, uh, really important thing to look out for downwind. Um, in terms of, I don't know if I've got some more diagrams. Uh, yes, oh, here we, here we go. I've got some slightly clearer diagrams, I think. Uh, when we're going downwind, there's lots of boats we end up with this big chain. So boat A is sailing along uh, down the bottom. Boat B is trying to overtake boat A and therefore starts covering them. But then boat C comes along and covers boat B and so on 
and this goes basically all the way up the downwind leg. And so there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, um, if, you're, if you're boat C, you're going to be overtaking, you normally end up with a big piled mess by the time you get to the bottom mark. Um, uh, but you can think about your positioning uh, of your boat on the downwind leg compared to everyone else. So being covered is quite bad in terms of it really does slow you down significantly. Um, options to get out of covering. Uh, if you're here, you can, and there's enough room, scoot up uh, so you're out of the way of the sail. You could scoot down, but if the mark is down here, really, you want to be the closest boat going around the mark. So you can, I think I've got another diagram in a, in a moment. Uh, uh, so you can scoot up the upwind first. Um, so the easiest, easiest thing is you end up with this juggling of these boats coming down, covering each other. But it's kind of like that, like just, just all over the place. Ed, um, yes. Could you show with your pointer yeah. the direction you would go in what you call scooting up? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so you've got you. Yeah. If I just use uh, B and C here, uh, you've got the wind coming down with the board like this. Um, C is going to cover B, so you've got loads of dirty wind here causing B a nightmare. But what B can do is escape that by simply, uh, use a different color, uh, simply kind of going over here. Uh, okay. So if, if they're going down to a mark, um, they're going to the mark down here. Uh, no, that, that's a, a slightly too long. Uh, if they're going going to a mark, this one depends on. Control. Oh, there we go. They're going to a mark down here somewhere. Uh, both boats are going to want to be in the inside. Uh, so what happens? Uh, boat B can escape the covering, but then as soon as uh, boat B does that, boat C will also join them. So they'll end up up here somewhere. Yeah. Uh, in which case, boat B, uh, depending how close they are to the mark, might have another an, another little jiggle and try get up ahead, uh, or or they might sit it out. Um, uh, or they can scoot around. Um, it, it, it's a very situation-based thing. So, so boat A is boat A is having a better time of it, or is also <laughs> so so boat A is having the worst time of it uh, because um, boat A is being. Uh, I, I just go off that. Uh, so so boat A originally saying on its own it was covered by boat B. That's yep. bad enough. And then boat C covers it as well. Uh, so uh, boat, what, what, what's going to happen is you'll end up in this massive dirty air patch. Uh, yep. so, so boat A will, will be significantly slower than boat B and boat B significantly slower than boat C. So this is your, your opportunity for the, the order as such uh, to really be juggled around. Any more questions on that? Okay. Um, so uh, I talked earlier about. Oh, so we get good on time. Uh, I talked earlier about um, uh, a gate. Uh, these often don't occur at hunts, um, or never occur at hunts. But I thought I'd mention it because I, I find it quite interesting, uh, and it is good to relate some of the concepts learned with starting uh, to the downward leg. Um, so when you have to choose a gate, you'll either have to go around a left or a right one, and it's completely up to you what one. Um, but uh, it, it's quite a useful exercise to do uh, because it makes you look at bias. So like on the start line, uh, there's bias, which is where the start line, so if the wind's coming down here, um, let me just do a line, your start line's across here, it's not directly into the wind, and this makes there um, a bias. So one end is going to be more favourable than the other. Can anyone think what of these, if I label them A and B, would anyone know or take a shot at guessing whether A or B would be better in this situation? Anyone want to take a- I'd go a, for B. B, who is that? Why, why do, what do you think B? I'm assuming, is the wind coming from the top? So, 
uh, the wind's going down here, yeah. Uh, and you, are, you and your little boats were sailing. Uh, you've just gone around here and you're sailing down. If you go have... around B, then your claws hold when you come out? Yeah. Even though you're going away from the mark, whereas when you turn off to A, you're um, heading straight into wind? True. Uh, so I was thinking. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, um, uh, it, it's in fact A, just because it's a, a significantly shorter distance. Um, so, so what... Uh, you're right, if you go around B, you can go straight up here. But with A, you can tack straight away and head across. Uh, but because of the distance from, where's my laser pointing on my screen, of course, that's not going to work. Um, let me just clear that to make it a bit more. Your distance from here to here is shorter than here to here. Uh, and therefore, shorter distance is going to be quicker to sail. If that makes sense. Super. Uh, but I just thought I'd mention that, that never occur at Hunts, but uh, uh, just another little exercise to think about. Um, so just thinking about dark, uh, downwind mark groundings, just going to touch on this briefly because it's quite interesting. Uh, it kind of puts a lot of the concepts together about controlling boat speed uh, and your five essentials into one. Uh, so uh, I find the da downwind mark grounding the most stressful time uh, as there's a lot to do. You have uh, a massive great sail all the way far out and you need to get it in uh, and there's lots of boats around you're being covered um, uh, and then you've got to plan where you're going up the next leg uh, so oh, i can't remember what i put uh, i'll start with this bit um, the best way around to go around the downwind mark is wide in and tight out uh, so what what this means is we want to approach with a wide berth here and we want to leave leaving right next to the mark. The reason for this is if we don't, um, we leave a massive gap here. Uh, and as we round up, we slip sideways. Uh, so what this means is uh, when we're going, uh, we're, we're heading upwind now, um, we are positioned significantly further away uh, and there's enough room for another boat who's next to us or behind us to sneak in and then be above us. So then we're in a situation where there's a boat here, a boat here, and we're the bottom boat despite being the first one round. And now we're in their dirty air. So we're going to go slower. Um, so we don't want to be in that situation. Uh, so we want to be the first out around that mark really tight. Uh, and the best way to do this is leave a big wide berth, come in. This can be about a boat length distance. Uh, and then we want to pull the sail in really quickly and then scoot up literally right next to the mark and away. Um, the best way to do that, uh, the main thing is, well, the main problem is such, is getting your main sheet in really quickly. Uh, so you might have touched it, and again, this is a very practical thing, uh, but you want to do something called hand over hand sheeting. Um, uh, I'm not sure how well I'm gonna to attempt to demonstrate it. I wish I had a tiller or something, uh, but hand over hand sheeting is basically uh, when you, uh, so what can I use as a, as a makeshift tiller? I don't have anything. If you're holding a tiller and you've got your main sheet, hand over hand sheeting is when the, the process of using both at the same time to get your main in really quickly. Because you can move and flick your tiller around all over the place uh, without having to worry about the steering because it's got that little joint on the end. Uh, so you can move your tiller around without the actual rudder moving. We're going to make use of that by um, moving our main sheet. This is our main sheet hand all the way to the top tucking our fingers on the tiller and then moving the tiller up as well. So we end up with an action like this. That means we can get big arm lengths of sail in uh, really quickly and allows us to shoot up the mark in a way. Um, I'm not sure how well that was portrayed on Zoom, but uh, give it a go next time. Um, ha have, a, have a go of tucking the main sheet uh, with your tiller hand, holding it on the tiller and then pulling it in and then you grab the main sheet from the bottom and you get this hand over hand sheeting action, uh, which means you can get the sail in really quickly. And that allows you to scoot up quickly. Just that back. Um, so I made a little <laughs> edge downwind checklist as such. We'll just run it through really quickly uh, um, to see some of the things to think about as such uh, when you're going around that bottom mark. So when you're halfway through the downwind leg, uh, you want to be planning the next leg. So this is when you're looking at some of the, the weather stuff Tom was talking about. Um, is there any gusts? Can you see any gusts? Is there a favorable side of the beat? So um, for example, at Hunt, 
uh, one side might be slightly more windy when you went around the first lap. You realize one leg is uh, one side of the beat is significantly windier than the other, which often occurs. If you think about um, uh, at Hunt, uh, the if you're going from going up by the clubhouse, uh, that normally one side, the clubhouse side, uh, in the prevailing wind direction is ever so slightly stronger, um, and that can be used to, used to your advantage. Um, the other things to think about is for sailing on the sea is tide. If one side of the beat could have a really strong tide in the channel, uh, and the other side could be uh, uh, no tide at all, so you want to use that to your advantage. Uh, and then, of course, if there's a gate, what gate are you going to go around? So that's the kind of stuff you can think about when you're going downwind. Have a look around, get your head out of the boat. As you can see, the conditions as you're going down. Then, when you get to about ten boat lengths, you want to be started planning your mark rounding. So, um, uh, the, I can't believe I don't think I mentioned it earlier. I must I must have skipped past the side. But one of the great things uh, you can adjust with when you're going downwind is your daggerboard. Um, as I'm sure you're you're aware, the daggerboard uh, it, it prevents slippage in the water. Uh, and when you're going downwind. There's not much slippage because there's no force pushing you sideways. The wind is coming from behind, so it's pushing you straight down the beat. Um, so what, what we can do is you can bring the daggerboard about half up, um, approximately all the centre board, um, and, and that will just reduce the drag. Um, about 10 below the legs, we can put this down as it doesn't make too much difference uh, and saves another thing for later, but really important when we go around the mark. Then when we're getting a bit closer, we can start adjusting our outhaul and kicker. Um, uh, for the next leg. Uh, the kick is one of the most important controls, if not the most important control. So we're going to save that to last, uh, but we can put a little bit on uh, to get ready. I normally do about half. Uh, and then as you get closer, three boat lengths, that's when you get your overlap. So you can plan your mark rounding exactly. Well, how are you going to go around? Do you need to call for water? What rules have you got? Uh, and then as you're coming around, can start bringing in the sail. You've got a lot of sail to bring in. So that's when you can do your hand over hand cheating. And then tight mark rounding. You're going to scoot up next to the mark, go, uh, and then uh, as soon as as you're going around, you can fiddle and, and um, adjust your controls slightly more uh, to suit the situation. Um, done that. Any questions about that? Lovely. Uh, so just my last bit for me. Um, I just thought I'd talk about some boat-specific downwind course-made goods as such. Uh, so, um, uh, 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 what boats have we got? We're, we're mostly single-handers here. Um, but as a single-hander, your fastest route downwind is straight downwind. Uh, that, that's always going to be the case. Uh, so we can go straight downwind. But I just thought I'd make make the point that um, it, it's quite useful because to know what, what the other boats are doing on the race course. Big asymmetrics, so that's when the, the um, you've got your spinnaker on a, a on a pole out the front of the boat. We need to zigzag downwind. They can't go directly downwind, so they have to take a course like this going all over the place. Um, to the contrary to that, symmetric spinnakers, like on a mirror, for example, uh, they go dead downwind too. Uh, um, so so if you get a chance to sail some other boats, uh, that's just something to to take into account. Um, I've got some videos. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know how well it works. So I can post these later. But there is a particularly good one I recommend watching, uh, which is I don't know if you will be able to see this. Can you still see my screen? Uh, <coughs> there, uh, it's quite long, so maybe we won't watch it now, but I can post it. Uh, it's a RWA uh, video on downwind speed, and it kind of summarizes some of the points I've said earlier. Uh, as, uh, explaining it a bit more in a video format, uh, so I can I can post that and we, you can watch that in your own time. Uh, but I do recommend it's a very good video. Right, I, that's all from me, I believe. Uh, did anyone have any questions or anything they would like to add? Can can we get the um, the powerpoints from you? Yeah, of course. I'll I'll put the PowerPoint uh, and the video links uh, in the Hunt Sailing Club Thank um, you. page. Okay, so of course, if are there any questions now? 
<clears throat> if there aren't, we will go on to the fun part, the quiz. Um, <laughs> as, as I'm not Vanessa, we, we haven't got a Cahoots quiz, par partly because I seem to be doing really badly at the Cahoots quiz. I could never go and push the button quick enough. Mm -hmm. However, so I, we've got one that you will have to go and write down the answers. Um, I also think that some people will have done this before because this was, um, sorry, the weather pick ones were the ones I gave for a, um, ooh, hang on. Uh, I, I gave for a, a women on the water. Oh, now that's wrong. That's not the one I wanted. So I'll stop sharing that one and I'll see if I can find the right one. Right, can you see race training quiz? Yes. Ah, excellent, right. Okay, so I will go through the, the, uh, the weather questions quite quickly. Um, they're quite simple, so I think you should have no trouble. Um, we'll, uh, we'll go through them and then we'll go back and uh, get the answer. So name that cloud. Cumulonimbus? Yeah, you will write it down. Don't tell everyone. I'm oh, sorry. They'll, they'll copy your answers. <laughs> right, has everyone finished that one? We'll go there. So, yes, if you see Cirrus invading the sky, what change in the weather would you expect? Um, Tom, could you go back one, please? I hadn't quite finished doing C. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Thank you. But Thank Maria, you. you've done this before. <laughs> Have you finished now? Finish, Maria? She's muted herself. Oh, sorry, well. yes, I have. I was nodding frantically. Oh, I, I, sorry, I can't. I can't see. I, I'll uh, I'll go and show. Yeah. So, if you see Cirrus invading the sky, what 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 do you expect next? Okay. If everyone has, gotten... hang on. Ah, name that front. So three fronts to name. This is unfair, actually, because I didn't go through this in detail, but never mind. And, and really, with a frontal system, it doesn't matter exactly what they're called. It's just to remind you that uh, you should remember that it is where one air mass meets another. OK, I'll next one. Yes, what happens when the wind, uh, to the wind when a front passes, passes over you? Ah, yes. And what direction does the wind go round a low pressure system in the Northern Hemisphere? Okay. Ah, right. So you've got uh, so what can you say about the wind in uh, at the position A and B in the middle of Spain? It'll be warm, but, but what's the wind doing in the middle of Spain? And what's the wind doing in A? 
I don't know. Okay. Ah, what wind would you associate with this cloud? Okay. Ah, <laughs> hot sunny afternoon near the coast. Uh, what would you expect the wind to do? Okay, we finished. Ah, and here's the trick question. What's minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius? I just threw this in for, for fun. It's actually easier than you think. Ah, and what's 25 knots on the Beaufort scale? And actually, I remembered I have, uh, I looked this up when I last gave this, uh, this. I will have to look it up. So I'm going to move on here to, uh, to Ed's talks now. Okay. At the bottom of the downwind leg and you approach the mark, uh, do you want to go in wide in, tight out, or tight in, wide out? What is it called when you're sailing behind someone downwind and your sail is blocking the wind from getting to their sail? Uh, in light winds, when going downwind, how would you set your, your kicker? In very light winds, where should you sit in the boat when going downwind? Was that the last one? Oh, if you are feeling overpowered, which control should you use first? If everyone's finished, we'll just go to the thing. Uh, so, you want to mark your own uh, own scores. Uh, a is a cumulus, B is a, a stratus, and C is a cirrus. Although it has to be said, when you get any meteorologist, two meteorologists to get, to, together discussing uh, cloud types, they tend to disagree. Uh, so if you see cirrus invading the sky, it tends to be uh, indicating that you've got a, a warm front coming. So you've got a, a, a frontal system coming.
so that would indicate that you're going to get uh, rain possibly and uh, uh, a change of wind direction. Name that front. Uh, a is a warm front, B is a cold front, and C is a, an occluded front. Uh, so an occluded front is where the cold front has caught up with the warm front, and so the, the area of warm, uh, warm, front, uh, warm air is pushed aloft. And, and just as a uh, matter of interest, the, the point where you get sort of the most act activity and the, the um, largest amount of rain uh, on a front is the triple point where you've got the cold front, the warm front and the occluded front uh, meeting. What happens to the wind when a front passes over? Well, you get a, a change of wind direction. So it will go from, uh, in, this, uh, in this one, it will go from, from this direction, which is uh, south, uh, southwesterly to a, a westerly direction. Is it? What direction does the wind go around a low pressure system in the Northern Hemisphere? Uh, and it's anti-clockwise. So it goes that direction. As a Southern Hemisphere meteorologist, I have to think about that one. Okay, what can you say about the wind at A and B? Well, if you look at the, the isobars, they're much closer together in A than in B. So it's, you've got much stronger wind in, in A than in B. And the other thing you could say about it is that, that it's colder air coming down. You can see the, it's quite cold air being brought down from the, uh, from the Arctic. Uh, and so it's likely to be more unstable here. And so you're going to be, it's going to be gustier uh, and possibly uh, showers in that, that airstream. Whereas in the B, it's going to be calm and probably sunny. So what wind would you associate uh, with this cloud? Well, it's uh, cumulonimbus, so you're going to have uh, a gust front. Uh, well, you're going to get gusty wind as it, as it goes over. Hot sunny afternoon near the coast. What wind would you expect? Uh, it's a, a sea breeze of course, so you expect the wind to pick up. Ah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll ask you what this, the answer to this one is. It's dead easy. Can anyone remember from? I think minus 40. Yeah, exactly. Well done, Sally. And 25 knots in the Beaufort, uh, in Beaufort is, is uh, does anyone know? Is it force five? Uh, I think it's just force six. It's all, you know, it, it's only just in force six, though. So. Two knots in force six. Hmm. Okay, so over to you, Ed. So the bottom of the mark uh, widen tight out. So that's when you, you want to leave the mark uh, right next to it to avoid you to slip sideways. What's cool when you say behind someone downwind? Uh, so that is when you're covering. So that's when you're stopping the wind from uh, for, from um, uh, hitting the, the sail in front of you and slowing them down. So covering. In light winds, uh, when you're going downwind, you want your kicker really loose. Uh, of course, it's boat specific, uh, but normally it's no, almost completely off uh, or just a, a, a very small pull to keep the boom down. Uh, in very light winds, where should you sit? Uh, you want to be sitting far forward uh, and you can sit a little bit to windward uh, to help the sail keep uh, its shape. So the main point there is far forward. And if you're feeling overpowered, what control should you use? Sorry, I should have emphasized this as downwind in particular, uh, but you want to be using your, your downhaul, your Cunningham, uh, uh, as a first, um, once, once you've got your control set, uh, if, especially if there's a gust coming through, you can just put a, a big pull of downhaul on uh, and that's really effective uh, at uh, depowering you. Um, uh, uh, till, uh, in particular in the gust, because it's so easy to put on, you can put a big tug of downhaul on, uh, get through the gust and then take it back off. 
uh, rather than fiddling around once you've got all your sales set. Oh, was that the last one? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, that's just the five for me. Oh, okay, right out. I'll stop sharing. So it's fantastic because I didn't take part in the, the quiz this week, so I don't have to be embarrassed like I was in all previous weeks with the quiz. Do, do people want to go and admit their scores? <laughs> can, can I just say I got I got all of uh, Ed's correct. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. That's, that's, but on the well, other hand, but on the other hand, appalling <laughs> your concern, Tom. I'm I'm embarrassed. No, that's fine. Well, that's that's probably means that uh, that Ed is a is a better instructor than I am, and I have in, fact, I have in fact <laughs> suspected that for a while. <laughs> Well, I took the liberty of giving myself third third marks or half marks on some of the questions. So <laughs> I got thirteen point eight three. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Any more marks? People I wish to. Seven. I got seven. Oh, okay. Well, that's not not bad. How many how, how many of Eds did you get? Um. Oh, quite a few, but I I know some of the weather ones because uh, some of yours because I've done a lot of sea sailing. Yes, well, I, the trouble with the weather, well, with with weather, with meteorology, is that there is always a, a bit of de debate about some of the of the questions. It's never quite clear cut, as you can tell from the weather forecast. Sometimes, any other scores? Yeah. Can you be nice to yourself and things like dirt when it's called covering? Can you say blo I use blocking? It's quite a similar word. <laughs> they, they mean the same, yeah. Do That's they? Can I give myself a mark? <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> I put mean. <laughs> mean. <laughs> <laughs> but it's called covering, not blocking. Covering. Covering's the, the general term, yeah. But it's, it's more important you know what it is rather than you know the technical term. I mean, it's with the, the sailing. I mean, with, with sailing generally, there are a whole lot of nautical terms that people use, that, that we as instructors use mm -hmm. to show that we are somehow superior to the rest of you. But it's, it's totally meaningless, really. You know, you've got to know what it means and do it rather than the no yeah the, the, the i've been teaching someone uh, this week who's dutch uh is, speaks perfect english but doesn't know a single sailing word in english far better sailor than me uh but <laughs> i've been teaching her the english words for sailing stuff <laughs> well I, I i hope you've been teaching her the wrong ones making up <laughs> <words>. <laughs> yeah it's when people suddenly say bang instead of um kicker mm. coming home. They, there's sort of some that it seem to be interchangeable. Yeah. So a, a book on sailing that I would recommend is The Art of Course Sailing. That, that has, I'm pretty sure that has a, a section on someone making up words for sailing to sailing yeah. terms to go and confuse people. It's, a, it's quite a good book, I think. It doesn't teach you about sailing, of course, but it is quite a fun book. Book, my book recommendation, this is slightly outdated, uh, is the Rules in Practice book by Brian Willis. Um, ah, yeah, well, it's updated. Your copy is updated, but they have yes. just print, published a new a new edition. Yeah, they have. Yeah, so this is the 2013 to 2016 edition as the rules change. Uh, but it has uh, it's, it, the beginning section or the, the majority of the book explains every single rule with very nice diagrams and pictures. Uh, and so it, it can go through everything you need to know uh, very clearly. And then it, it also has a full copy of the racing rules at the back uh, and also has a lot of things to reference, such as the flags used at starts, uh, how the starting procedure works for racing. Uh, so I, that's my Can you say reference. the name of the author again? Yeah, Brian Willis. Thank you. And, and the, the rules tend to be changed every four years. They, they're changed in Olympic year. For, mm -hmm. for some reason and so they have just been updated not very many changes but if you buy the book now you've got four years before it goes even slightly out of date <laughs> okay i think that's possibly all are there any more questions oh yeah 
I think John is, John's got the John is showing that he has in fact bought the latest copy. <laughs> <laughs> the rules in practice. Okay. Oh yeah, if John has it, it must be a good book. Yeah. Okay, I think I, I think we'll call it a, a day now. We've been just a bit over an hour and a half. Vanessa will be back next week. I am hoping that we will have another guest presenter. Uh, next week. Is there anything that people would really like to do next week? Next week is in theory the last Zoom session. It, if we can, we will try and have at least one on the water session uh, before Christmas, but that depends on the, the government and, and, and the weather. So, you know, whether we manage it or not is in the lap of the gods. Uh, is there anything people would really like to, to do next week? Tom, um, it's my it's my my fault more than anything else. But I would can we have two minutes on the run, the beat, close horde? It's the jargon that throws me at times. Um, okay. To, just do you, do, you, do, you, do you want to do a quick session now? No. no. Oh, okay. No, okay. We'll 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 do it. We'll, that's that's quite a good idea. So yeah, jargon. It's the downfall and the Cunningham. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll we'll we'll. We'll we'll do a, a section session on on jargon next week, and perhaps we'll make a, a handout too, and a quiz. Oh, well, <laughs> of course we'll have a quiz. Well, Vanessa will be back, so it'll be a cahoots quiz, and so I'll do really badly. Uh, yeah, Claire, I've uh, passed that on to Vanessa already, but I'd be quite interested just to know a little bit about the different types of boats that people are sailing at home. Yeah. To no, I, I I saw your email. She passed it on to me. So yes, we 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 will we'll do that. That that's that's a good idea. Maybe a bit on double-handed sailing, like uh, yeah, roll, roll yes. through. Um, Although you are the only th that's the trouble. There are so few double-handed sailors now. You are the the only one. Um, but you did see that Ed did have the asymmetric spinnaker in just for you. <laughs> Yeah, although I think I probably use it too much, so we all seem to lose on the downward leg if we do that. It's, it depends on the wind, I guess. And, yeah. I, I think the problem with spinnakers generally is that you you have to get it dead right, or it's not it, it's not worth it. It's, I mean, particularly on, on a mirror, which I have sailed and my my children have sailed lots. You know, it was very noticeable that unless you got it dead right, it was faster not to put it up. And also, Tom, I wonder if it's because uh, because we have relatively short runs on our lake. The time we've got it all up and are faffed around with it, time to take it down. <laughs> well, so th that's sort of what I mean by getting it right. You know, you want to cut the faffing around down, you know, because there's always, you know, unless you, you're really good at it, there's always this, you know, pulling it up and the getting tangled and, yeah. and, and everybody not, shouting at each other. Not, <laughs> and then getting it down and, and you know, overstepping the mark because you can't get it down fast enough or pulling it down too soon. And, and you know, it, it is, it is a disaster. So it's, as with all things in, in sailing, it, it's just practice. Asymmetrics on particular hunts I found, as soon as I set them, the wind changes and then you reset, 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 and it's time to drop. So just practice. With the asymmetric one though, you said the runs are short, uh, but we could make a longer reach, which you could use the asymmetric on without a problem. Yeah, so, I, so uh, Ed showed that uh, sort of typical Olympic course um, and of course, we never sail that at Humps. We always sail some complicated course, especially when I'm race officer. <laughs> as many as many boys as, as possible. So we try, you know, we try on the lake to get, you know, a, a a good beat, a good run, and a good reach to so that all the possible sail uh, boats that we sail can be be catered for. Ah, uh, Sarah. Yeah, Unmute, unmute, sorry. Um, the, when you have your course of the different points, could we have a sort of basic, um, a, what you would, like when it, when it was downwind, you'd go straight down to the next one. Mm -hmm. Just a sort of a case study example of where you'd actually tap, what you'd actually do with your boat to get from ABC, basically. Uh, Wind. Yeah, well, well, uh, I can flush it up very quickly. And, uh, so as in, on this course, 
yeah, if you if it's just a few examples of different courses, how you'd suggest going down, whether you where you tack, how you do mm. well, uh uh um to start, everyone usually starts on starboard because otherwise it's a complete mess. Uh, so everyone uh generally will start going off this way. Uh depending on the wind conditions, some will go off and then if there's clear uh clear air, you'll you'll get the fleet starting to tack. Uh, if it's undecided, you, you then get a split uh, as, as people go either side uh, up the beat. Uh, and then it just depends on the conditions in terms of where people tack up the beat up to number one. Um, then you, they'll go down to one, uh, depending on what course you're looking at. This is a, this is a, a broad reach here. So this would be uh, just about broad enough to put up an asymmetric. Um, uh, uh, and then, so, so that would be straight down to two there. Uh, and then, um, Depending, uh, depending how well the course is set, uh, two to three or, or down here would be a dead downwind beat. Uh, so where you jibe on that usually depends on who else is around you. As in, if one person jibes at the top and heads down here, um, you, you might do the same. Uh, so you stick with them if you're going to cover them. Uh, or, or, or if there's a big gust one particular side of the beat, uh, you might want to jibe early, say you're going over here, uh, you, you, you might want to um, uh, scoot around here and come over here uh, or, or get over here. And, and, and that would determine when you jibe. Um, uh, it, it's often the case people would, people head down slightly and then up so they can secure their place uh, at this bottom mark. Um, so so uh, in that case, they would head down here uh, and then jibe halfway down and then come back across. Uh, and yeah. then, sorry, John, you... So, sorry, it, it pays not to necessarily jibe right on the leeward mark as well. You need to jibe prior to the leeward mark if you've got to jibe. Otherwise, if you if everyone's jibing down here, it gets a bit messy uh, with the booms flying everywhere. Uh, it's It'll be, especially because the amount of stuff you've got to do at the downward mark with controls, getting your sail in, uh, it's good to have that out of the way beforehand. Um, and then again, you've got a nice, uh, a nice broad reach down here, um, uh, and then then you're up onto the beat uh, and back up and and repeat. Does that kind of cover the? That's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I need to put it into practice now. Definitely, <laughs> it's the only way. And of course, the the exact course you sail, particularly on the upwind leg, depends on the wind. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it'd be impossible to sit at the bottom mark and go right exactly where I'm going to go. You just tack on the shifts, uh, generally, yep. uh, and, and follow the wind up. Yeah. Okay, is there, is there anything else now? In which case, I think we'll, we'll meet next, uh, next week, same time, same place. Thank you. Thank, thank you all thanks, for coming. John, thanks, Ed. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Nice weekend. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Again. Bye. Bye. Thanks.